All right, it's time for our last lesson in Unit 2.0. Last time we talked about inverses and just kind of their general properties. Today we're actually going to do some work to find inverse functions. So a few things to remember. The graph of f of x is reflected over the line y equals x to create that new graph f inverse. In doing that, any point a, b that was on your original function now becomes the point b, a, which is on your inverse function. The domain of f will now be the, is going to be the range of f inverse, and the range of f of x is going to be the domain of f inverse. So again, if you think about your inputs of f are now becoming the range of f inverse, your range of f inverse is now your domain of f inverse. Sorry, your range of f is now the domain of f inverse. All right, given f of x, find f inverse. We learned last time that a horizontal line test will help us determine if there is an inverse. There's no point in finding it if you don't first know that it exists. So thinking about the graph of 3x minus 2, it's going to be a line that's 3 times taller, move down 2, approximately there. It's our linear function. Well, that's definitely going to pass a horizontal line test. This function over here, we've got 2x to the third minus 5. So we're going to take our cubic function, stretch it pretty tall, and move it down 5. That will also pass a horizontal line test. So now it's time to actually find that inverse. In doing so, there's four steps. Make them nice and color for, colorful for you. The first and the fourth step are really just notation things. Okay, They're important, but they're not actually the math behind it. So the first thing you want to do is replace f of x with the letter y. It'll just help you in moving variables around. Second thing is to switch all of your y's to x's and x's to y's. This is where you're actually changing domains and ranges. If you're turning all of your y's into x's, that's turning your range into a domain and a domain into a range. It's that reflection piece. Then you're going to solve for y. You're going to isolate it, which we practiced in an earlier unit. Then at the end, you're going to replace that y that you solved for with f inverse, because you've just done all the work to get the inverse function. And then the last step is sometimes asked of us, not always, but you can verify by composition to make sure that you did the work correctly. If you verify and you don't get an answer of x, something went wrong in steps one through four. So go ahead and take a minute, make sure you have these steps written down in your notes. They're going to be very important for our next examples. Pause if you need to. All right, so here are our two functions that we had. Given f of x, find f inverse. We already determined that it exists, so we are going to actually now find it. All right, first thing said to replace f of x with the letter y. Done. Next step says to switch all y's with x's and all x's with y's. Got that. Then it says to solve for y. Well, that means I'm going to add 2 and divide by 3. Then the next step was to replace y with f inverse. And we could verify by comp composition, take x plus 2 over 3, substitute it in here, and we should end up with an answer of just x, which we'll practice on another slide. It does actually end up being a true statement, which is a good thing. Something else you should notice about your inverse, in your function f, you're taking a letter, sorry, taking a variable, multiplying it by 3, and then subtracting 2. Well, here, you're taking that same variable, you are adding 2, and then dividing by 3. You are undoing what this function was trying to do. Moving on to f of x over here, let's apply that first step of replacing f of x with y. We already determined this one has an inverse from that horizontal line test. Then it says to replace all y's with x's all x's with y's. Now we need to solve for y. 
This one's going to have a little bit more work to it. I'm going to add 5 to the other side. I'm going to divide both sides by 2. And then to undo that raising to the third power, I'm going to take a third root. Last step is to just change our notation. And again, if you wanted to, you could verify by composition, take this function, plug it in for x up here, and everything should simplify out to just be x. Which again, if you think through it, this function cubes, multiplies by 2, and then subtracts 5. This function adds 5, divides by 2, and then takes a cubed root. It's undoing all of the features in your original function. All right, given g of x, find g inverse. Well, the first thing you want to do is just make a quick little mental check that g inverse exists. Realistically, we're going to focus on ones that do have inverses, but you'll see a little bit of a trick in the next slide. The square root of x plus 2, it's a parent function. It's been moved to the left 2. It's going to have an inverse because it will pass the horizontal line test. So let's go ahead and find it by applying our steps. First thing is to replace f of x, or in this case, g of x, with our letter y. Then we're going to switch all y's with x's and all x's with y's. That's actually where you're changing domains and ranges. Next thing is to get y by itself. So I'm going to square both sides. And then the very last piece, get that function notation back in place. Now, this time we are going to verify things. If I take x squared minus 2 and I plug it in for x up here, My answer ends up being the square root of x squared. Well, that could be positive x, or that could be negative x. We want it to be positive x. We can't be having both of these answers. So let's think for a second about what might need to change for our domain. x squared minus 2 is a parabola that's been moved down 2. Does this pass a horizontal line test? If I throw a horizontal line on here, black and blue are intersecting definitely at more than one point, which means that we can't have an entire parabola as our inverse because we want it to work the other way too. We should be able to substitute in the square root of x plus 2 square it and subtract 2. Squaring that, you get x plus 2 minus 2. That one equals x. So we've got to do something to make it so this function works. Well, if I just decide to take half of my parabola, now, if I think about that line y equals x, get a different color here for you. Now, if I take this blue one and reflect it, it does create the black graph. So I don't want to have my whole parabola. I only want my parabola where x is greater than or equal to 0. I want the positive part of my parabola. The other way you know this is right here, this is the positive square root version. And we want the positive square root, so we want to keep the positive part of my graph. Given g of x, find g inverse. Okay, well this is a similar thing. We want to plot this graph first, make sure that it has an inverse. x minus 4 squared is going to be moving to the right 4 and squaring our function. Will this pass a horizontal line test? Most definitely not. So as this stands, you don't have an inverse. 
Now, you'd like to think, okay, well then good, we're done with the problem. But of course, we're going to do a little bit more work to make sure that we can find the inverse. So there's two different ways that we could do that. We want to make sure we restrict the domain. I'm going to start first by looking at just this blue piece of my graph. If I look at just the blue, does that pass a horizontal line test? Yes. Which means that if I throw on the restriction that x has to be greater than or equal to 4, because this was our x value of 4, now I'm just talking about this blue piece, and the inverse will exist. My other option would be to just look at this red piece. Does the red piece pass the horizontal line test? Yes, it does. So I could keep my g of x function. But I'm going to put the restriction that x has to be less than or equal to 4. That would be talking about this red piece right here. So now our steps are still the same, because now we have created functions that do have inverses. So I'm going to replace this with a y. But I need to carry this restriction with me throughout the whole process. So here's where I'm going to switch all y's with x's and all x's with y's. This is an x, which means we need to replace it with a y. Go ahead and solve. I'm going to take a square root of x. And I'm going to add 4. Technically, when you take a square root, you get plus or minus. Okay? But this right here tells me I want everything greater than or equal to 4. Well, in order for this to come out greater than or equal to 4, I can't take this negative part right here. So I only want to keep the positive square root of x plus 4 will be equal to y, which means positive square root of x plus 4 is equal to g inverse of x. Okay? Because of this y is greater than or equal to 4, we want to keep the positive part. Alright, so for the blue one, we kept the positive piece because we're talking about this positive part of our parabola. I want you now to think about what's going to happen, make a prediction, if we're talking about the left part of the parabola, the x is less than or equal to 4. You're going to go through, apply your four steps, and see if you can pick which one of these you want to keep for finding your inverse. Go ahead and pause your video to try this next problem. All right, here are my four steps that I applied. Switch g of x with y, switch all of my x's and y's, including this one. When I took a square root, I get both plus and minus the square root of x, and then I added the 4 to the other side. But this tells me that y has to be less than or equal to 4. Well, in order for y to be less than, uh -oh, less than 4, this piece right here that you're adding to 4 needs to be negative, because you need to actually be taking something away from 4. So I want to keep the negative part of that square root. So this becomes my inverse function. Now, with that movie magic that I love so much, up here I took the time to draw in my blue function with its inverse function in green, and then that red function with its inverse function in yellow. And you can see both of those have created reflections over that line y equals x. Okay? Now, red and blue together made a function that didn't have an inverse because green and yellow together make something that's not a function. So you have to take it in pieces by restricting that domain. Our last thing is to practice verifying, which is really just using composition, substitution, in order to check that g of x is the inverse. So I want you to take the time to find f of g of x and g of f of x. Go ahead and do your work, pause the video, and we will reconvene in just a minute. All right, I did a little bit of color coding, substituted this red function g into f up here. Everything cancels out. You're 3 divided by 3. Everything reduces, simplifies to x. Over here, plugged in this green function into our g of x. 1 and negative 1, 3 divided by 3, those cancel. You're left with just x. Very last thing I just want to let you know, a reminder, this is the same thing as 1 third x minus 1 third. If it helps you to see it as a line, 
You can take this three under each. Some parting words of wisdom.